It's going to take us a little bit of time to get out of John chapter 6, a very important uh, chapter in the Bible. So we flip over there tonight. Uh, we've been preaching out of it for a couple of weeks, uh, so I'm going to see if I can make a little more headway today, amen, or tonight. John chapter number 6, we find a couple of miracles that have taken place uh, in John 6, and but what I want to look at tonight, I want to look at verses 22 down through verse 31. Chapter number 6, verse number 22, the day following. He's talking about following the day when Jesus fed the 5,000. When He fed the 5,000, then the Lord went up into a mountain to pray and be alone. Uh, he sent the apostles uh, put them in, told them to get in the ship, go across the other side. They're on the east side. They're over uh, on the east side. They go back to the west side where Capernaum is. And they, he's talking about here the following day, all right? When the people which stood on the other side of the sea, that's where Jesus uh, was. When they saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein his disciples were entered, that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping, and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when, thou, when camest thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do and that we might work the works of God? It reminds me of that Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. And they said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou, uh, what dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Now I'm not going to deal with that tonight. But what I want to look at, I want to look at and. and that verse, verse number 30. Now, verse number 29, he said this, This is the work of God, that you believe on Him. He's talking about Christ, whom He, the Father, has sent. And they said, Therefore unto Him, What sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? I want to look at that portion of Scripture for a few minutes tonight. Uh, in verses 20 through, two, through 25, uh, here we find the verification of another miracle. Uh, when Jesus went up to the mountain uh, by himself and he told the disciples, I want you to get in the ship, I want you to go to the other side, go from the east back to west to Capernaum. I dealt with this uh, the other day, but I, I want you to see what he's, what he's doing here. Uh, they saw him leave, so they, it was nighttime. It was getting dark when the disciples left. Jesus went up to the mountain. The following morning, when they came down, they looked for Jesus, and Jesus wasn't there. Now, if you read verses 13 down through verse number 21, we find that Jesus, in the middle of the night, or actually in the fourth watch, went walking on the sea. So he walked across, halfway across to where the ship was. They were toiling and rolling, and the wind was contrary to them. In the middle of the night, here came Jesus walking on the sea, and he got into the ship, and then the ship went to the other side. But when they got up in the morning, they're looking for him. They know that the only boat that's missing is the one that the apostles left on, but they can't find Christ. 
So they saw that other boats had come from Tiberias. If you look at the uh, map of the Sea of Galilee, Capernaum is at the northwestern side of the Sea of Galilee. Down below it is Tiberias. Matter of fact, the Sea of Galilee is also called the Sea of Tiberias. That ships had left Tiberias and come to the side where they were. So they got in these ships and loaded up and went back over to Capernaum. And when we got, they got to Capernaum, they found Christ. So the first thing they wanted to know was, we saw the apostles get in the ship and leave, but you didn't leave with them. There was no other boat. How did you get here? He never answered that question. They had verified in themselves that he got there without a ship. They knew the only ship that was missing was the one the apostles was on. They watched them get in. They watched them launch out and it was getting dark and watched them head across toward Capernaum and Christ was up in a mountain. And then the next morning, they can't find him. There's no other boats missing, but he's on the other side. Now, that, that told them that something miraculous had happened. I got to thinking about that. You know, there's a lot of different miracles that they had been subjected to. One, the miracle of incarnation. In John chapter number one, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So we find that they had the prophecy of the Old Testament and the fulfilling in the person of Christ. It bothered me today to see Benjamin, Sarah Netanyahu, as he had his little hat on his head. And it showed them, and then he, went, he was up and had his hand on the wailing wall up there. Uh, that's where they go and pray for Messiah to come. They, they want Messiah to come and, and to get the nation uh, back to where it needs to be, and there he was. And, and it bothered me when they did that. But they, had, they should have known when Christ would be born. The wise men from the east knew when Christ was born. Anna and Simeon knew. You had the shepherds, the angels made the announcement there. They've got all the prophecies. So the miracle of the incarnation, and they missed that. Then the miracle of the water turned to wine in John chapter number two. Hey, everybody knew about that. They knew that something great had happened that day, something that was extraordinary, something beyond their comprehension. Then you had the miracle of the new birth in John 3. Now, even though uh, I don't know if Nicodemus got saved that night, we do know that Nicodemus was converted. I think there's a good possibility that he was converted that night. But when he came to the Lord, he made the statement, Rabbi, teacher. Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Now, he used the word we. That means that all the Pharisees recognized that he was a God-sent teacher. Even though they didn't accept him as Messiah, if God sent a teacher, sound like you'd listen to him, right? And he gave him the story of the new birth in John chapter number 3. They saw the healing of the miracle of the uh, uh, healing of the nobleman's son in John chapter number four, uh, right after he stopped at the well. I didn't deal with that particular miracle, but they, they knew about the miracle of that nobleman's son. And then the miracle of the impotent man in John chapter 5. Then now we have the feeding of the 5,000 in chapter 6, and he's on the other side. It would seem like to me they would catch on to something, wouldn't they? But they didn't do that, and he talked about the hardness of their heart. In, in the book of John, the Bible said, Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat the loaves and were filled. But in Mark, he, he, can, he spoke about the disciples. He said, For they considered not the miracle of the loaves, for their heart was hardened. So these people came to Jesus Christ and they came to Christ just simply for what He could do for them, but not because of who He was. And that's why He didn't answer them. He just simply told them, when you ate the loaves, He said, hey, 
and were filled. He said, that's why you seek me. And in verse 27, he said, labor not for the meat which perisheth." And he talks about that meat that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. For him hath God the Father sealed. Now, he revealed himself to them again in these two verses. Now, we're getting ready to get into the discourse on I am the bread of life. There are actually seven different discourses where he used the phraseology, I am. They understood the words, I am. So he told them who he was here. And then they said, well, uh, tell us what we need to do. And he just simply said this, that you believe on him whom you've sent. I thought about this. They didn't want the Old Testament or Christ. They were looking for a sign. The Bible says a lot about that, about uh, sign seeking. It said they asked for the sign. Uh, and, and, and then over in Mark chapter 8, it said the Pharisees came forth and began to question him, seeking of him a sign from heaven, tempting him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and saith, Why doth this generation seek after a sign? Verily I say unto you, There shall no sign be given unto this generation. Signs constitute what we call extra-biblical revelations. Something outside of the realm of the Word of God and outside of the realm of Jesus Christ. Now they had both. They had the Old Testament that canon was of Scripture was gotten together and that canon was completed in what we call the 400 silent years between Malachi and Matthew. By the time Matthew came around, they had the entire canon of Scripture in the Old Testament. They had none of the new. So they had that, but they had Christ Himself, the Word of God in the New Testament. I thought about... Uh, Israel, you know, they, they wanted a sign instead of Jesus Christ. You'd think Jesus would be enough, wouldn't you? Huh? But they didn't want Him. That's why He came unto His own and His own. It didn't say they knew Him not. It said they received Him not. I believe that they knew that He was a teacher come from God. I believe if they had taken the time uh, to study the prophecies that they would have known who He was. And yet they told Him, He said, you need to believe on Me. And they said, no, we need to see something that's done uh, uh, beyond that. We need a sign. We need some extra biblical, extra Word of God revelation. If we see that, then we'll believe on you. They had to... Or, Jesus, they, they had the Word of God, it wasn't enough. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22 says this, for, for the Jews require a sign. The Jews require a sign. John chapter 1 said this, He was in the world, and the world was made, made by Him, and the world knew Him not. He came into His own, and His own received them not. They had the person of Jesus Christ. I'm talking about the Savior of the world, but the Savior of the world in His lifetime became the division of the sword. If you go over to Matthew chapter 10, and we won't go there. The Bible said, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I am come to send peace on earth. What were they looking for? A king that would set up a kingdom that was ruled by peace. That's why they missed Christ. They knew who He was, but they would have taken Him and made Him a king. If you look on, on back just uh, a little bit farther, you know, verse number 15, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take Him by force to make Him a king. Why would they do that? Because they were looking for one that was going to sit on the throne of David and rule and reign from that throne. They hated the uh, iron fist of Rome, the hill of Rome. Rome was a, a very wicked taskmaster. Uh, they hated Christianity. They hated any type of religion. They thought that the emperor of Rome was God himself. So they had to worship their own emperor as God and reject everything else. That's why they so highly persecuted. You look down through the annals of church history. And I'm talking about from, uh, from uh, John's day... Uh, 
all the way up. Uh, Paul appealed unto Caesar, but he didn't get Caesar. He got a crazy one when he got up there. And we find that all the way down through there, plenty of the younger, you've got Diocletian, you've got all these emperors of Rome that hated the people of God. So they should have known him, but they missed him. But here's what he said. Now, think not that I can bring peace. He said, I'm going to bring a sword or a division. And he went on and spoke about that division. He said, for I am come to set man against, at variance against his father, the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall they be of his own household. So they rejected Christ, and there was a division among the people. I looked at four reasons that Israel rejected Christ. One, because of where he was raised, not where he was born. If they had seen him on time when he came, they could have gone to Bethlehem just like these shepherds did. Now the wise men came to Nazareth. They came to the house where the small child was. And he was approximately two years old, according to the story that they told uh, Herod about when they had seen it. That's why he had all the children two years old, the male children uh, killed in Bethlehem that were two years old and under because that was the time that he gave. So if they, they should not have missed him, but they missed him. Over in John chapter 9, the Bible said how uh, this man is not God because he keepeth not the Sabbath. But he went on and talked to them about this man was born in Nazareth. He said that Christ cometh of the seed of David of the, out of the town of Bethlehem where David was. So there was a division among the people because of him. Now what happened was this caused a division among the people. Some believed some didn't believe. You always have that division when it comes to the Word of God and the Gospel here in the Old Testament. So one, because of where he was raised. The second reason they rejected him was because his miracles contradicted their religion. Over in John chapter 9, he placed clay upon the eyes of a blind man and washed him and he got his sight back. But here's what the Pharisee said, This man is not of God because he keepeth not the Sabbath day. Others said, How can a man that is a sinner do miracles? And there was a division among them. Jesus upset their religious apple carts. Man likes religion to do just this and this and this. And I thank God for order. I believe that things need to be done decently in order in the church. A lot of churches today, you know, they just say, well, the Holy Spirit came in. And every, there's no order to the services. There's no order to anything. And that's between them and the Lord. But I believe in church services that we need to have order. I thank God when people praise God. I tell them, you praise God all you want. When you get done praising God, then I'm going to preach the Word of God to you. And we're going to keep things done decently and in order. So they rejected Him because of where He was raised, not born. They rejected him because his miracles contradicted their religion. The third way, because of who he claimed to be. He said over in John 10, Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This commandment have I received of my Father and there was a division, therefore, again among the Jews for these things. He claimed to be God. They rejected Him as God. They said, Thou art a teacher come from God, but then He called God His Father. And they rejected Him because He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed to be the Son of God. And then last, because of the words that He said. Over in John chapter number 6, he said, But there were some of you that believed not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not, and who should betray him. And he said, Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. From that time many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? I want you to notice how the crowd is getting smaller. 
The more they reject Him, the more the people leave Him, the smaller the crowds that actually followed Him. I've often said that Jesus Christ virtually died alone. Even His disciples forsook Him, and, they, and thank God uh, they came back to the upper room and the Lord met with them. And I think the Lord, only one of them was a, a devil, and that, uh, that was the one that betrayed Him. But at the same time, we find that throughout the life of Christ, the more the division among the people, the less people that actually followed Him, that actually went in the other directions. So we find in Israel that they are rejecting the Son of God. Why? They rejected the prophecies. He came and fulfilled these prophecies. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elias. I was talking to a man today and he said that he was Elijah in, incarnate, incarnate. I said, no, he, he came in the spirit of Elias, the spirit of Elijah, preaching the word of God to the people. John the Baptist and they rejected John the Baptist. He identified Christ at his baptism. He identified him publicly the next day. His miracles identified him. And yet the farther they went, the more the division came among the people. And the masses of people began to go away from him. And he died virtually alone. I've often said that if you check your disciples, the apostles, every one of them died virtually alone. Nobody wanted them. The prophets of the Old Testament, they died virtually alone, persecuted, stoned, killed by the Pharisees, killed by these crowds. So we find that there was a division among the people. They said, when he said, you believe on me, you believe on the one that was sent, you believe on me, that's, listen, that's all they had to do. You know how the Old Testament people got saved? The same way you got saved. They accepted the coming of the Messiah for their salvation. They knew that that Lamb of God was going to come and take away the sin of the world. Abraham told Isaac, my son, he said, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering, prophetic of Christ. They were on Mount Moriah. There God gave them a substitute. That's a type of the atonement until Christ would come because God never wanted him to kill his son. He just wanted him to be willing to do that. But you find they wanted something extra. When you get into the days of the apostles, boy, they, they did a lot of wonderful, wonderful things. Christ did. Christ healed the lame. He made the uh, lame walk, the dumb uh, to speak, the, the deaf to hear, the, the blind to see. He cleansed of leprosy. He raised the dead. He walked on the water, stilled storms, fed thousands. Listen, time after time, and them seeing what he did, they rejected him and wanted a sign on top of what he had already done in his lifetime. Salvation has always been faith. It was faith in all the, I'm talking about in, in the beginning, salvation has been faith in a work that was having to be finished. So we find that they needed the same thing. What they needed? Hey, they needed a sign. We've got the same sign seekers today uh, in, in the Bible Belt and every place else. Uh, boy, you've, you've got all types of denominations out here. They believe all types of stuff. I had a good opportunity today to talk to one of my neighbors and a preacher. I'm not sure where he has been a pastor, but he's, he's not in a pulpit right now. I guess he's seeking one. And boy, I mean, he was getting on board. I, I sat in the one window, what, 20, 30 minutes, I guess. And, and shared the Word of God with them. I didn't have my Bible in my hand, but I was just quoting them the Word of God. And I was watching him. Matter of fact, you pray for him. He asked me uh, where the church was, and I told him, and he wanted to know if we had uh, if services on Wednesday night. I said, yes, at 7 o'clock. I'm in the book of John. I about halfway expected him to walk in here tonight. But at the same time, I, I thought about the days that we live in. It's always got to be the Bible plus something to these people. In 1906, in the Azusa Street Mission in Los Angeles, California, for the first time in 2,000 years, somebody spake in tongues, and it was a woman. 
And it started what they called the Azusa Street Revivals. They just went on and on and started getting national attention. And before you knew it, the tongues movement was everywhere. Hey, you got Baptist people that speak in tongues. You've got Roman Catholics that speak in tongues. You've got all types of people that speak in tongues. Nuns that are speaking in tongues. Uh, this intelligible gibberish. Uh, hey, the tongues they spoke in in the Bible were naturally acquired languages. So God just simply gave them the ability to speak in a foreign language to people that were there that could interpret what they were saying. That's why they said you don't speak in tongues without an interpreter. They didn't know what they were speaking, but God knew what they were saying as they were putting the Word of God out. So you find extra biblical revelation. You talk about people today, they talk about dreams. They talk about visions. They talk about all these things plus the Bible, all right? It's always the Bible plus. These people are hard to move. They're hard to do anything with. I had a man one time, I spent about an hour with him, and he told me, he said, I spoke in one, tongues one time. He said, the night I got saved, never spoke in them again, never wanted to. He said, show me what the Bible says. And I took him through the Bible. And when I got done, I'll never forget what that young man said. He said, if I hadn't spoken in tongues, I would have believed you. And I thought you took your personal experience and put it above the Word of God. Hey, he should have said my experience evidently was a wrong experience and should have agreed with the Word of God on it, but he didn't. They've got dreams. They, they, they've got all types of visions. They've got healings. Uh, I've, I've dealt with a lot of healers before. Listen, they're fakes. And the bad part is they know they're fakes. That's why they only try to heal certain people and these are the ones they allow to come in. I knew of an independent pastor, and I'm not advocating this, that went to a big healing service. I was trying to think which one uh, the big healers it was. But he said that people that were literally having to be carried in on wheelchairs, they didn't let them in. But they had their own crowd that came in there, and then they would see somebody out there, and they, they were plants. And they were carrying on out there about their healings. Listen, if they had the power to heal tonight, why don't they go to these hospitals and children's homes and heal them? Lay the hands on them. Let them get up. They, it's always faith uh, plus something. And you've got to be careful with place uh, something above the Word of God. We've got the Word of God today. They've got the Word of God today. And yet the Word of God is not enough for them. Just sporadic uh, views, uh, uh, groups all over the place. And today those uh, movements continue uh, practicing these gifts and things and you can't talk them out of. I just want to say tonight, all you, all you need tonight is the Word of God. That's all we need. All they needed was the Word of God, the inscribed Word of God that they had and the incarnate Word of God that they had. Tonight we've got the Lamb of God that took away the sin of the world and we've got the Word of God. We need nothing else about that. I was talking to these men today uh, and I just simply told him that we are biblicists. We believe that the Word of God is the final authority for faith and practice. And we adhere to the Word of God. I told him I'll stay with the Baptist as long as the Baptist stay with the Bible. But when they get away from the Bible, then I'm going to have to get away with them. I thought about politics. I'll stay with the Republican Party until I have to get away from them. Eventually, I will probably have to go independent. I'll still vote for the lesser of two evils, but I'm going to be careful where my identification is if they continue to go in that left stream to where I can't stay with them anymore. And there, there'll come a time to when I can't stay with them anymore because they'll be pushing abortion, they'll be pushing uh, same-sex marriages and everything else in order to gain votes. One of, the, one of those men said the other day, he stood up, he was a young Republican, I think from Texas, and he said after they kind of lost the elections this last time, he said, we're going to have to change our politics because we're going to have to move to where it is. When he told them, the work of God is that you believe on Him that sent me. 
believe on Christ. Believe on the one that was sent. That's all you've got to do. The first thing he said was, What sign showest thou then? He said, We want something plus. We want something else tonight. I thank God tonight that you don't need anything else. Extra biblical revelation. What is that? That's any revelation that comes outside of this. This is the, all the revelation that you need right here. I was talking to a man the other day and witnessing to him, and uh, he sounded real good. He cornered me up. Barbara and I were out, and boy, he just kept talking. And Barbara was talking about it, and I said, hey, his theology is good. You would have thought he was as fundamental as anybody on the block until the last. He said, you need to study the Bible and get all that you can get out of the Bible. And when you can't get any more, he made that statement. I want to say tonight, you can always get more. You can always get more. He said, then God will give it to you by revelation. And when he said that, I thought, ah, oh, you're off on it. Amen. We don't need that extra biblical revelation. We've got enough problems in, in the fundamental uh, part of the world as it is. Amen. So, hey, we, we've got today, you've got all types of Bibles. You've got all types of things going on. You've got division everywhere. And do you know why you've got all that division? Because in the 1800s, they found an extra biblical revelation. From 1611 to 1881, they had the Word of God. That was all they had. They believed the Word of God. But in the 1800s, something outside of the Word of God was reinduced. And when they did, it was a critical text, not, not a text that agreed, but one that disagreed with the received text. And it became the critical text, and they began correcting the old text with the new text. You say, what was that? It was an extra biblical revelation. For the first time in thousands of years, they had a new line of text that appeared, and that has called more division in Baptist ranks than anything in the world. Listen, all you need is this old book right here. This one is the one of our fathers, our grandfathers, I ask you to raise your hand. How many of your parents was King James? And you'd raise those hands up, right? But you're seeing a division in that now. People are leaving the old path and they're going to the new paths and it's an extra biblical revelation. Amen. Let's stand tonight and we're going to have an invitation. If you need to come, you come. What's extra biblical? Something outside of the realm of the body. A Bible that you've got. They had the Word of God. They had the Word of God. They had to inscribe. They had to incarnate. And they rejected them and had to have something outside of that. You stay. Just stay with you.